All right, welcome to the Libre Quest podcast. My name is Matt, and I'm joined by a very special guest. He is the creator of the Flat Earth Clues, a computer ping pong wizard, and resident of Whidbey Island, Mark Sargent. How are you, sir? I am doing well. Thank you very much for having me. And just to correct you, it's not computer ping pong, it's computer pinball. Oh, right. Yeah, computer pinball. That's right. That's Sorry, all man. right. I mean, it's old enough. Honestly, when you go back that far, people, you know, ping pong, pinball, people just think, oh, shit, that's that's old people video games. Well, that's... what, what, um, no, I wanted to ask you about that later, but first I want yeah. to get into the how did you become a flat earther? Dun, dun, dun. Standard opening question. I became a flat earther because I was conspiracy bored. I ran out of conspiracies to look at in the middle of 2014, summer of 2014, actually, and decided to kind of delve around. I was kind of delving around in, in, in Hollow Earth. I'd been around in that for a little while, and... It was interesting because one of the threads of Hollow Earth was a United States Navy admiral named Richard Byrd, who was tied to the Hollow Earth. And, and lots of people in the conspiracy world know that that he's somewhat tied to uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth type thing. The first man to fly to the North Pole in a rickety plane in 1926. And then he, sp- he spent the rest of his life flying around Antarctica, literally from 1928 up until his death in 1957. It was strange. It's like, why Why is he connected to this? And then I started going down a few rabbit trails. There weren't a lot of rabbit trails to go down in 2014. And said, all right, well, you know, since I'm here, I might as well see if I can debunk Flat Earth and, and shoot it down. And the more time I spent on it, the more it reinforced it to where I ran out of arguments against flat earth at the begin in february of 2015 so i made a series of videos called flat earth clues and put all my contact info online and pushed it all out to the internet and said okay internet hive mind who is really really intelligent tell me where i went wrong tell me how i can prove the globe in a court of law and nobody came back at me with okay here's how you prove it i i thought somebody in academia would have shot this thing down and they didn't to where I, six months later, it's like, okay, well, everything's reinforced. And then everything started to snowball and a lot of subject matter experts came out and a lot of people were interested in it. And here we are six years later and books and a documentary and a whole bunch of podcasts out there, different people that are doing things, uh, the you know, conferences and meetups. I got a meetup next month here in Seattle and it's been amazing, amazing ride. And just because I put the idea out there, it's like, look, maybe we're living in a building. Prove me wrong. So how did, what was your first, what was your first, what got you started down the conspiracy road? Like what was the first conspiracy? Oh, just, just conspiracies in general. Well, I'm older. So when you're growing up, if you grew up in the seventies and the eighties, you heard about the, the old conspiracies that now there's ones that the media allow you're allowed to talk about. You can actually find library books on it, even in public schools, like, you know, stuff about myths and monsters. In fact, there was a, a television show to that name, uh, like Bigfoot and aliens and the Loch Ness monster. We, we've all here heard that sort of stuff. And I put about as much stock in them as I, I did um, vampires and werewolves at the time. <clears throat> Didn't really think much of it. And then in the early 90s, I caught um, Oliver Stone's JFK. And that was the first one. That was when I first it was got into conspiracies for real. Because remember, this predated the internet. And without the internet, conspiracies were not that prevalent. You had to go to UFO conferences. And even those weren't very well organized because there was no internet. So, um, and MUFON, I think, was out there, you know, the, the big UFO group. But I, don't, I still don't think they were as, as big as they are now. And JFK really drove it into my head. I was very naive. Again, I grew up on a rural island in north, northwest of Seattle. And didn't think that people in authority would ever lie because, you know, they had with great power comes great responsibility. We shouldn't lie to the public. And then later I find out, well, transparency is a great idea in theory, but truth is what, what you don't know won't hurt you. That That's generally the rule that's used when it comes to people in power. And power corrupts. The more power you get, 
the the more chance you have to bend the rules to to suit your needs. So yeah, JFK was the first one, and then after that, I started looking into things like the moon landing, and then well, by the time two thousand rolled around, you know, the whole nine eleven thing. And all the other stuff to where I, I had an opinion. I still do. I have an opinion on just about every conspiracy you could think of. But those are the first. So the JFK, you weren't buying the uh, magic bullet theory. Is that? The <laughs> well, thing? Oliver Stone did a fantastic. That'll go down as his, his opus. That'll, that'll be his, his greatest movie ever. I don't care what else he made. Uh, I mean, I liked a lot of the stuff he made. I mean, yeah, he won Best Picture for Platoon. But JFK was, I mean, look at the the the, star, the, the all-star cast that went in on this. Because there was a lot of people that really liked JFK. Um, but no, the Magic Bullet Theory, no, no, not a chance. Uh, it was very well done, and the editing was perfect. He, he showed what you can do with film. And that is if you intersplice actual film and pictures and images with his own pictures and images, and you do it well enough over two and a half hours, I think the director's cut three hours and change, you, all of a sudden, the suspension of disbelief is is there. I mean, you are you are locked in. I saw it in a, in a packed house in Seattle back then, and I remember it was one of the first movies that when I walked out of it, aside, aside from like Platoon, which everyone was really sad, but that was the Vietnam War. When I walked out of JFK, I mean, everyone was angry. People are like, yeah, freaking government. People, people don't remember that he went, when he was going on talk shows, doing the talk show circuit to promote that movie, There were got, the government had to send out spin people to Rip. give their rebuttal while he was on stage you know, because he they realized, even again, this predated the internet, how much traction this thing was getting to where nobody believed that it was you know the, a lone gunman. And come on, let's face it, you know, it was... It's the worst of all, the worst, which is a lone gunman who defeats all the security services in the United States, right? Who is then killed by a lone gunman who defeats all the security services in the United States. It, it's, seriously, it's like a, a unicorn getting struck by lightning. Not very likely. Sure, at yeah. the least, I would say. But yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things surrounding that. I've watched a lot of documentaries. Uh, listen to a lot of uh, testimony and people saying it. Yeah, it definitely leaves a lot of questions to be answered. I I, I, in, I, th- I think I initially said a couple months ago that my best bet was you just like, well, who who was it? Was it the grassy knoll? Um, if you watch some of the the better documentaries on this, and some of them are are really long, uh, there was a whole bunch of shooters, a whole bunch. And the the grassy knoll guy didn't look like he got the shot. the 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 guy on the bridge looks like he got the first shot. And the last shot looks like, which is why this is a Bruder film was altered. the The last shot was taken by a guy in the um, in the storm drain, which was right next to it, which is why the car stopped. And they altered I've the, the Bruder. Yeah, so I've heard that. Yeah, I, I like that one because it's really close. I mean, it's super, super close, and it's like you've got to stop there. That is your fallback position. And what is this, uh, what is this document? Are you talking about a specific document? Yeah, I can't remember have? the name of it off the top of my head. But I mean, the other people have talked about it. But but I always wondered as years went on why the Zabruder film was even released. It's like, look, why didn't you just bury that thing? And I think what they had happened was after they edited it just ever so slightly to make sure that it didn't look like the car just came to a freaking halt, that it played for in their favor. It's like, oh, look, you know, graphic shots. And, and as time goes on, people, you know, will will see more and more that people will say, well, he's obviously shot by a rifle or something at close range. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I mean, it's after, let's put it this way, after the whole Flat Earth thing came out, JFK, no offense, uh, just became second tier. Plus, I was one of those rare, rare individuals that said that JFK was going down. He was, he was going. I mean, my lord, he could not take a hint, to, to literally, to save his life. I mean, he was bucking a system. the 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 brand, you know, the the paint was still drying on the military industrial complex left over from Eisenhower, and he he wouldn't play ball. And what did you think was going to happen? You know, he was and he was going to get reelected. That was the big thing. 
I was trying to tell people, like, look, I go, the reason why they did that in 63 was in 64 he was going to get reelected. And that was going to take him to 68. Then Robert was going to go from 68 to 72 and then 72 to 76. At that point, heck, they may have even forgiven Ted for, for his sins. And that's that's 16, at least 16 years of Kennedy's in the White House. Yeah, the powers are never going to let that happen. Never going to happen. He he might as well have been wearing a Caesar T-shirt because that's what it that's what it ended up being. Well, I'll be, I'll be honest. That is a bit before my time. I'm, I'm uh, I was born in '82. So oh, yeah, it was a bit, a bit before my time, but I have seen the um, I have seen the film. I, well, imagine a politician that has no allies. <laughs> imagine that he gets into office because his father buys him the election, just barely buys him the election. He Nixon was supposed to win. It was supposed to be Nixon in the early '60s, and he and once he's in, he just starts creating all this havoc. You know, made, I mean, not, just just wreaks havoc. And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I'm sure he was he was given veiled threats, and he wasn't going to listen. And that was it. He was he was ousted. And then again, Bobby, his brother, who. Who basically they it was a warning thing to Bobby as well. I was like, like, don't you even think about running for president? And the second he did, he was like, Oh yeah, we're not even going to the elections on this one. <laughs> You're not even making it to the primaries. And that was it. And then Ted, the last brother, he's like, Yeah, I'm just gonna stay a senator. Thank you. And he was, he was a senator for the rest of his life. So sorry. I wanna t- I wanna try and tie this back into the into the flat earth just a little bit because uh, I want to ask you about because you mentioned it before the moon landing. Yeah. Do you believe they faked it? And if they did, can you prove it? Sure. Uh, yeah. Do I do? Well, it's not just the moon landing. Everything about NASA was faked. Every single thing. There's certain documentaries out there. I remember there was one guy and I know it seemed a little sensational for TV, but he said, no, no, no. We didn't fake just some things. We faked everything. And he's absolutely right, because here's the thing. When you fake something that big, you can't just fake part of it. And I've had people come at me and say, well, OK, fine, because there's a lot of people out there in the conspiracy world that think the moon landing was just trash. The production value was terrible. Um, and then they said, well, yeah, but the ISS is real. It's going, Why? Why? Why would the ISS be real? I go, it's 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 the um, one of the first rules of crime. You, you know, you fake one thing, you steal one thing, you might as well steal it all. If you kill one person, you might as well kill the rest of the people because the punishment's going to be the same no matter what. There's no there's no piecemeal here. As far as the the, the how or, you know, the the yeah. the easiest way, the one I usually throw out at people is just a single Apollo 12 shot. And it's just a, you can pick. There's all sorts of one. I just picked a random Apollo 12 shot where it's just this beautiful shot of the astronaut taking a picture of his friend. Uh, next to the lander in a satellite dish. And it's like, no, it, the longer you stare at that shot, the worse it becomes because you realize that whoever staged the shots, the iconic shots for Life Magazine and National Geographic, that was an advertising firm. They, they, were, they were told, instructed at some point, it's like, oh yeah, you've got to make it look really, really good. And these guys knew nothing about physics or engineering or light, you know, actual physical lighting and so they just made the shots look beautiful. And but the thing is, they don't make any sense physically. Um, the, there's a shot I could I could I'm not going to throw it on your phone right now because it'll it'll screw it up. But I'll, I'll send you, it afterwards. Um, yeah, yeah. Can you email it to me. Oh yeah, yeah. You... I absolutely can email it to you. The um, uh, it's an Apollo 12 shot. But the the first thing you notice, I, I tell people, I say, okay, look, there's one light source on the moon, right? It's the sun. It's 90 million miles away. All the shadows are going to run parallel. That's how it works. One light source, the the far distant light source. You, you know this. You walk outside, all the trees, the shadows are going in one direction. All the telephone poles, the shadows are going. Every shadow goes in the freaking same direction. Why? Because the light source is 90 million miles away. But the shadows in this shot, they're, they're going to intersect. And it's going to happen in a hurry. You can tell, they, they, I mean, it's not subtle. They are all bending severely inwards. And... That only happens if the light source is very, very close. Okay, how, how can there be a, a very close light source on the moon? They didn't bring secondary lighting. That would be ridiculous. And so, look, it was a stage light, 30 yards, 50 yards away at the most. A light bank of some sort. But it definitely wasn't the sun. Uh, the second point would be these light footprints everywhere. In the, in the perfectly, by the way, no one ever questioned that, the ash. You know, it was like three to four inches of ash. 
mm-hmm. all over the moon. You never saw anyone with a shovel dig a hole. <laughs> Why? Because that would defeat the whole stage purpose of having three to four inches of ash. But that's not the problem. The problem is you've got all these footprints everywhere, but there's no blast crater underneath the engine. That's 10,000 pounds of thrust. There should be a splay pattern that's 30, 50 yards wide. And there, there, there isn't a speck of dust moved from underneath that. It's like it was just set there. there you should, it should have burned away or blown away that ash to where it was bare rock. Never, ever happened. And it's like, uh, that's, that's, that's just two. I'll give you one more just for the hell of it. Um, the satellite dish, which is sitting there. You know, it's this beautiful satellite dish, and everyone now knows, oh, that's how they transmitted stuff back home. I'm going, really? Because that's 1969. That thing's running off a, a, that's a VHF transmitter running off a car battery. I go, that, that thing has a range of 50 miles, if you're lucky. And that's Morse code. You, you, and you're pumping out 10 frames of color video a second and perfect two-way communication to the Earth, which is a quarter million miles away, through the Van Allen radiation belt, I might add, with no interference, no snow. It was perfect communication all the time. There was never, it was, it was absolutely freaking flawless. No, no. It, it, what, what's powering it? It's like, oh, no, they're bouncing off the, the geo. But most people don't even know that. The, the third astronaut was supposedly in geosynchronic um, uh, orbit above them. It's like, okay, fine. You're firing that thing up hundreds and hundreds of miles up to him. And then how is he boosting the signal? Makes it even more problematic. Between so those... He's, go ahead. He's, he's basically supposed to be orbiting in static orbit around the moon. And yeah. he's getting signal. And yeah, yeah. He's supposedly yeah boosting it back. It's like, okay, uh, again, more problematic. How's he lining it up analog? And how, again, it's the bandwidth. That's that's the part that's throwing me. What, what, what machinery back then? I mean, look, I can drive... Uh, 40 minutes in, in a direction here in, in up in Washington, I can lose cell signal. But in 1969, their communication was absolutely freaking flawless? No. Nope, nope, nope. Never, never, ever going to happen. But it worked. It absolutely, oh, sorry, last, last one. Uh, I'll, I'll throw in one more just for a bonus. And that is the spacesuits. Uh, the spacesuits don't make any damn sense. And that is meaning in a vacuum, again, this is the part that they got away with just murder because people do not, especially the Americans, when we get out of high school, we don't know anything about engineering or physics or biology or chemistry. We know just barely enough to graduate and then drive. That's it. So um, the vacuum, right? We're, we're not talking in a vacuum. Right now you're breathing in mostly nitrogen, 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen, some trace gases. Well, vacuum, remember, there's no atmosphere on the moon, so there should be a massive pressure differential. Massive, right? Meaning, and you can look it up, look up anything on YouTube or any video about anything in a vacuum chamber, anything soft. Basketball blows up, volleyball blows up, football, stretch Armstrong, anything that's pressurized, can of, can of soda, boom, just blows up. Why? Because the pressure has to get out. There's only one thing in the history of, of anything that's defied this. And that's the, the astronaut suit. How does a soft suit, how does that suit not become a basketball? And no one will explain it to me. I've put this challenge out there for years. I've said, tell me what magical technology is in that backpack. I don't care about heating and cooling and oxygen and CO2 and all that other stuff. I go, tell me what stops that suit from expanding. And people's, I've, I mean, I've people come back literally to say, well, layers, it's, it's special, special classified layers. I go, no, 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 I go, layers, I, my, my winter coat has layers. I go, the, all it does is going to stop the, the, the heat and the, and the cooling type thing. It's not going to stop the, the pressure differential. And you can look up the old videos of the early, early astronaut suits that they were testing in the early 60s. They were all these massive plastic and metal things because they knew they knew full well. It's like, yeah, we're, we're not going to, we can't have a soft suit. And then someone came up with a brilliant idea. God bless him. I hope he's, I, I, I hope he died in an island somewhere surrounded by beautiful women. Where he said, you know what? Let's just do a soft suit. We'll put it on TV. Nobody knows anything about physics anyway. We'll totally get away with it because it's on TV. It's real. Well, they'll just think, oh, it's salt. We solved it. And it did. It, it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. The suit, they were walking around. Not only are they walking around and they don't turn into parade floats and tip over and die, their arms and legs work perfectly. Their knees work perfectly. The, um, their fingers, they should be oven mitts at that point, but nope, they can manipulate complex electronics. 
All sorts of fun stuff. Never feats of strength, by the way. That never happened on the moon. Remember the 180 pound man on the moon weighs 30 pounds. The, the, the heavy is it? The what? I mean, like lifting, like lifting. Oh yeah, hand. you should be able to lift one hand the back of that freaking rover. You should be able to throw things. I mean, everything that we saw in the movies, they should have done, and they didn't. All they did was the feather test and the and the other, you know, dropping that and a hammer at the same time. Uh huh. And it's like, well, okay, why'd you do that test in the first place? You know, we we have a vacuum chambers on Earth. We we can do that here. So why'd you have to do it up there? Oh, because we had to we had to prove something to the to the doubters. No, no, the production it, it aged horribly. It's even little things like uh, why would NASA not give the direct feed to the networks, NBC, ABC, and, and CBS at the time? Why did they say, oh, no, 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 you have to come to the Kennedy Center. We're going we're gonna to sh- project it up onto a screen. You're going to have to film that with your cameras from there. And people are like, oh, what are you talking about? That's second generation. The, the, the quality would be crap. Why would, you let us, why would you make us do that? They had no explanation for it at all. And in, in fact, it was the inspiration of why Capricorn One, the movie, was made. The fake Mars mission movie was made was because there was a CBS affiliate who saw the production. He, he was piping it through, you know, the, the moon missions, piping it through his station. He's going, oh, this is horrible quality. He's going, he goes, I could make a better moon mission. No, I could make a better Mars mission than this. And he didn't even think it was fake. He just thought their, their production value was terrible. And that's how Capricorn One became the the biggest grossing independent film of of the year that year, and it never got remade. Nah, you know why now? It's a big movie. That's yeah. not a movie I've ever seen. What oh, Capricorn it? One. Oh, rent it if you get a chance, or hell, you can probably watch it on free for just about anything out there. It was um, it was the the whole premise was is that they were going to do a Mars mission in the late seventies, which is weird because we have the Orion project out there and still hasn't gone anywhere. A fig, a, well, they were going to do a Mars mission, and they pulled the astronauts at the last second without telling anybody, launched the rocket, and they said, look, the, the life support system was flawed, you were going to die, so we're just going to fake it. And they took them to a soundstage in an, a desert Air Force base, and they faked it, and the astronauts got developed a conscience, <laughs> and they decided they were going to run. They were going to tell people, they were going to go to the press, and well, you know how that's going to go. It's like okay, well, we're we're gonna the, basically the back half of the movie was them hunting down these astronauts while they were trying to escape this desert installation, and it's like why again? I was the plot point. The astronauts would have never would have never done that. It's like look, you're you're Air Force officers, you were psychologically screened. You never, which is why the astronauts don't say anything now. You know full well. I mean, every every astronaut we have, you know, the the end. They're Air Force officers. I've talked to them. They uh, they're under different rules than we are, and you know their emails are tracked, their phones are bugged. If if they even hint at developing any guilt, they are either talked to or you know other things happen. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm definitely gonna watch the movie now. I kind of I want to ask you about something though, because I I know I um I don't I don't typically do um or at least have until now this type of, of content maybe like conspiracy content but i wanted to ask you about um how familiar are, are you with uh, linux uh a little bit enough to where i had friends i mean old school you know what, what was the term uh, lunix was how that what they called it <laughs> back, back in the day um a little familiar with it it's it's old i know that okay so in your opinion if flat earth were to run linux what distribution do you think it would run <laughs> that's a silly question. It's just that's. A, you know. I have no idea. I have no idea. And I, again, remember, I was in the software world for a bunch of years. I have no idea. Le, I, yeah. Linux pre look. I was not a developer as much as I was a producer when it came to to software. I mean, yes, I did a whole bunch of testing and I did tech support for it, but no, the the hardcore developers. They were in the cubes on the other side of the building, and we we came to then when we had to yell at them for why things broke. But uh, but but Linux came up every once in a while. Well, if you don't mind, um, again, I appreciate you you coming on with me to do the interview. I'm really interested in your uh, pinball. Uh, oh yeah, Vic. Yeah, you were a certified pinball wizard. Can you tell me like okay about the so game I, I system? W- yeah, yeah. I was a gr- growing up. If you grew up in the '80s, 
you were part of that generation before Super Nintendo, before any of this other stuff. You know, there was, um, you know, like Pac-Man and Defender and Space Invaders, you know, the, the first generation coin-op video games. And there, and there were also pinball machines. Now, pinball machines predated those. You know, pinball machines have been around, whew, late 50s? Well, hell, the origins even go back even further. I mean, pinball has evolved for the last 100 years. And but when the, you could you could attach uh, ROM to them, you know, with, with digital memory, you could create all sorts of fun stuff. Digital sound effects was the big thing, and all sorts of complex scoring and and payoffs, which was just wonderful. And and Williams Pinball, which I swear by, I really really loved it. And so I was really good at, at traditional pinball. And then when computers started filling up the, the scene, I got good at, because it's really the same thing, you know, the, the model is basically the same, which I got good at digital pinball. And there was this little developer out of Japan uh, named Little Wing, and they developed a, a, a series of pinball games, and one of them was called Crystal Caliburn which was loosely based off a Williams pinball machine called Black Knight 2000, which was actually released in the 80s, you know, but it was like, oh, this is what it's going to be like, this futuristic thing in 2000. Anyway, so it, it wasn't a trademark issue. I mean, it was, it was very cool, but it was based on the Knights of the Round Table, and Black Knight 2000 was just about the Black Knight. Anyway, so they had this worldwide pinball tournament, and what they did was, remember, this was just when the internet was firing up. So the authentication systems really weren't that advanced yet. So what they did was they said, okay, if you get a high score, you can, you can choose this option. It says generate high score, and then you could, and it'll generate a score, an authentication code, which you then fax to them, <laughs> actual fax. And then they would, um, they would authenticate it. And I was playing for a while, and I was actually getting pretty good. Uh, I was I was in the top 20, I think, in the world at the time. And then I figured out uh, it's not a loophole, and I don't even think it's an exploit. But I'll tell you what I did. And you, because you're a computer guy, you'll, you'll, you'll get this. So I was thinking to myself, I was like, well, I'm not going to be able to crack the, the encryption for the, the code generator. Because, like, you know, I mean, why would I anyway? It, it seems like a lot of work, and I wasn't that, I wasn't that guy. But I was trying to figure out, it's like, wait a minute, we're not online or anything, so how is it generating the code anyway? I go, something's got to be random. I, the, you know, the score is what the score is, but there's got to be a, a random thing that's generating in there. And it's, it's got to be simple. You know, the, the programmers, are, they're, you know, they tend to lean on the lazy side. So I figured out just by chance, well, it was a guess, basically, that they were going off date and time because this was before your computer was automatically updated date and time. Back then, pre pre you, you had to check your date and time every once in a while because it would get off, and you know the internet was never going to update you. You had to you had to make sure it was always there, and you could change it back to whatever you know you could you could mess with it. So what I did was, I I would I got a score, and then before I generated it, I bumped up the um the date on my date time uh, an entire month because you can only turn in one score per month and this tournament ran an entire year and i took a chance i was like you know what let's see if it works and it worked and i was like right on and so you're thinking okay what's that get you well, what that reason why I did that was I was getting scores. In, in, if you were really good at this, sometimes your games would last two hours long. That was a long time to play playing pinball, right? Well, let's say you got let's say you got um, eight hundred and fifty million, right? And then your next game you had nine hundred million. Well, you had to throw out that eight hundred fifty million. Well, that eight hundred fifty million was already top top twenty in the world. It's like I didn't want to waste these perfectly good games. So what I did was, I, when I got a, a game that was pushing a billion points or whatever it was, I'd generate the score and I'd put it a month ahead. And then I then it took the pressure off. So where I could just... So basically, not I didn't just win the tournament. I won it six months before it ended and didn't tell anybody. <laughs> so I just lined... So I had all these scores lined up every month for at least six or seven months. 
lined them up, and the scores got increasingly good. And I even had a backup one because I had some rivals. There was one in, in China and one in France and, and another one in, in um, the U.K. somewhere. And I didn't want it to turn into a horse race. That's really what I didn't want. And I knew that players are lazy. It's like, well, I'm number one. I don't have, you know, they'll, they'll start, they'll pull back on their motivation. I'm number one. They're not going to catch me. So what I did was I made sure I turned in a really big score just before the tournament ended because there's like, there's no way he's going to catch. By the time they post it, there's no way they're going to catch it. He's going to catch it. And I was right. And, but the thing is, and so, and because of that, that, that whole um, tournament thing, the company out of the distributor that, um, that produced the game uh, out in Boulder, Colorado, they hired me as a, as a tester and a, and a ringer back then. So I got to actually play video games for a living and I never told them ever what I did. <laughs> and I, normally I would have, I would, I would have sized up whoever it was and said, Oh yeah, you seem like a cool guy. Let me tell you what I did. No, the president of this company was super straight laced. I mean, he believed in rules, <laughs> really believed in him. And I knew full well, if I would have told him a week later, he would have sat me down. It's like, sorry, the integrity of the company would be compromised. It's like, whatever, you know, and he was, he was, well, hell, he was the guy that um, the company folded eventually because the, the, the creator of the games out of Tokyo, the, the yen was falling against the dollar and he wanted to renegotiate the contract. He's like, look, he goes, the yen's getting killed over here. I'm losing money just because I'm, I'm for not doing anything. And, uh, the president of our company, uh, he said, he was like, he told me, he's like, contract's a contract. It's like, Oh man, you do not want to do this to a developer because he is gonna, and he did, he came back and accused him of everything and they went to arbitration and eventually the legal costs killed the company so well, there you go sorry. long story short that's how i got really into that's how i became the the pinball the greatest pinball player in the world briefly and uh, and then i had to sure. quit quit playing so i wasn't sure if you could hear me a minute ago i was trying to figure what, what company did you say it was it was out of japan oh oh the company was called little wing which little was wing. which oh. was based i believe off of a Jimi hendrix song uh, like a lot of Japanese people, this particular developer, his, net, his name was uh, Fujita, he, uh, he was fascinated with American culture. And so uh, I think Little Wing is a, is a, is a Jimi Hendrix reference. And what was, What's the title of the, like the ping pong uh, pinball. championship game? Pinball. It's just, that's, that was the title, Pinball? Oh, no, no, no. It was Crystal, Crystal Caliburn. So, Crystal Caliburn. Uh, yeah. C R Y Crystal and then C A L I B U R N. Okay, and I have a cousin. He was like really pressing me to make sure that I get the details on that. He's upset. Like he is a he is a library of information when it comes to to uh, computer and console gaming, and he's just he oh yeah, very... yeah 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 you can you can find it. I mean hell, you might even be able to. I don't know if it's still compatible with with stuff that's out there, but uh, well, it was in fact it was a the the producer was initially built for the Macintosh. The uh, the the produce the production house I I worked for that that worked against me a little bit in that I didn't even know because I came from uh, the my 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 mother was a teacher and there's a lot of teachers in our family and as you know uh, a lot of schools ran Macintosh only and this was a Macintosh house I didn't know how big the PC world was until I got there and we released the PC version of Crystal Caliburn and Looney Labyrinth and, and the other pinball stuff. Because we sold way more PC copies than we did Macintosh. And in fact, we went to, I got to go to E3, I'm sorry, Macworld in Boston and Macworld in San Francisco and E3, which was in San Diego. And E3 was so much bigger than Macworld. Even though Macworld, the, the people there were so much cooler, you know, Macintosh. This is way before the iPhone. Way, way, way before the iPhone. So that was in the mid, mid-90s. mid questions for you what what year was it that you won the championship uh 94 it was 94 okay yeah. all right cool and what what system were you running i'm curious about what what system you're running as your gaming as your gaming machine Did i would have been running when i won it i was using a mac lc2 okay that tells you how old it was uh in fact i i <laughs> The the Power Max hadn't really come out. I mean, when I went and ended up working for Starplay, the whole office was running off of Power Max, the early Power Max. And then I was I bought the initial because I was a Mac fiend for a while. 
Uh, I bought the initial iMac, the first iMac in Bond. It only came in one color, Bondi Blue. And uh, it was great. Loved it. But it was very limited. Uh, in fact, the, the gaming world, the, only the good games got released on Macintosh. And again, I was so naive. I didn't realize that everything came out for the PC first. And then <laughs> all my friends who were really into PC gaming, that's how I got into PC gaming. Where my friends, I had, I had one of my best friends was probably, in my opinion, one of the finest uh, gamers in the world at the time. Probably of of all games, he had he had eye hand coordination, which I'd never seen to this day. Uh, he was so good. He won the Duke Nukem World Tournament down at E3, and he got a, the chance to play the creator <laughs> as a bonus round, and he just humiliated him. I mean, he just, he, the, at one point, I think the creator was in negative numbers because he killed himself more than he, he killed Eric. It was so much fun. Uh, but yeah, it was, that's that's how I got into it. So, so sorry. What other technical yeah. questions <laughs> you want to throw out? No, was, so you're like, you're a, you're a computer pinball uh, <laughs> champion and you're also an original Mac gamer. And I didn't even know Mac gamers existed then. So yeah. that's fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were not, there were not a lot of us. Absolutely, were not that many of us at all. But and again, we didn't. I didn't know because I went straight from, from. I only knew Macintosh when I went to Boulder, and the office was only Macintosh. And then all of a sudden, they sat me down. And it's like, oh yeah, by the way, we we just installed a PC. I was going, oh great. And then, but then that's when all the guys were building their first rigs. They were building. You know, the, everyone was building their own machines, cobbling together parts overclocking crap it was way before liquid cooled and uh people were and then i realized okay if you want to play the really if you want to the, get the games you know be on the cutting edge of games you have to play pc that they made fun of me on a regular basis i'm like look what can i do it's a it's a mac house but so i finally gave up my i had a a, a power mac and i finally gave up and got a uh, i had some one of the guys help me build a a pc rig and then i've been pc ever since yeah. Well, that's that's awesome. Yeah. Power uh the power stuff. What were what were those um what were those processors? That was like were they basically like a Motorola processor? Yeah, those were the early uh and you're going to have to forgive my memory. The early risk chips. The early oh. the way I mean those those were the they were they were great actually great processors. The the problem that Mac had back then wasn't processor speed and wasn't memory or anything. It was price. They uh, yeah. they had just started realizing. You remember they they were proprietary and they didn't let anyone reverse engineer their stuff at all. It wasn't a um, uh, an IBM thing that turned into Dell, that turned into HP, that turned into everybody else. It was the um, they they wouldn't they 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 were very careful about licensing, but nobody could make money off of them. The uh, they they let a couple other companies turn do clones, and then they all folded. And people were questioning, it's like, oh, is Apple in trouble? And then all of a sudden, you know, they, they started coming out with their other stuff and they, they weren't going to lose. I mean, the iPods alone were, would have carried them forever. Uh, you, know, they... you know, about Mac, um, I didn't even know they allowed companies to do uh, clone systems. Oh, I, yeah. Heard of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, um, uh, and I don't remember the names. There was at least two or three of them out there that they, they let. They were very sticky about it. Where they, they were, the licensing agreement apparently was really strict, and they let them do it. But the for whatever reason, I, I think honestly they just they had their hands tied and they they didn't have the freedom. It wasn't the wide open. I, you got a feel for. I mean, it helped the world, but when when IBM again because nobody knew anything back then, IBM was like, well, you know, doesn't matter if somebody reverse engineers are our, our stuff it gets like ibm's on the tower and ibm and people will buy it for brand name and they didn't realize it's like no people are like when it comes to computers <laughs> people are like look if it works we don't care what the hell it says on the front of it it could say exactly. crappy tech <laughs> and people is like does it run yeah well, we're gonna use it and ibm just lost their freaking shorts because you remember well it predates you remember it was um ibm's strategy was they were going to come out with their own operating system and windows was never was never supposed to be windows was supposed to be temporary uh, it was yeah, supposed yeah. to be os2 
And mm -hmm. by the time Windows, you know, again, the, the people, they didn't under, understand the speed. IBM was this old stodgy company. And when OS2 came out, people were like, who cares? <laughs> Windows runs. All right, switching. And and then Windows, you know, started started making these huge moves. Kind of like, do you remember the um, the Netscape thing? Back, oh, yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Netscape, people used to pay for browsers. And Netscape was number one with a bullet. And then Microsoft says, yeah, we're just going to give it away for free. We've got so much money. We're going to bury you. <laughs> and Netscape is like, you can't do that. You can't do that. We'll sue. It's like, who cares? We'll tie you up in court long enough to where it won't matter. And who, 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 yeah. who do, kids just don't even know what Netscape is. Well, now, now they just know. Well, I mean, kind of the lineage goes all the way to, you know, Firefox and various other oh, yeah. you know, works of that. But, yeah. hey, I, I thank you for talking to me about all the computer stuff. That was yeah, awesome. Yeah, but yeah, I, yeah. I do have one more thing I want to get into. Sure. Uh, with you and that is the simulation theory can you just like explain to me what simulation theory is and and uh if it's why you do you, if you think it's possible oh no, it's possible? No, i not only think it's possible i think it's very probable and there are a lot of scientific minds that would agree with me it's sad that the movies like the matrix and the 13th floor which are now 22 years old I love that movie, by the way, the 13th Floor. That's, 13th that's, that's floor was, my favorite movie. Yeah, 13th Floor was brilliant, um, which was based off of a 1975 movie called World on a Wire, which was German. It's like, man, it's like that was bold. The Germans trying to make a virtual reality movie in the 70s. And that was based off a 60s book called Simulcron 3, you know, Simulcron Simulation. And the whole concept, it might as well have been a Twilight Zone. Really, the whole movie was a, an extended Twilight Zone, um, really a, a plot that was drawn out, which is you develop a situation, which they did in, in Star Trek Next Generation in one of the episodes, I can't remember the name of it, where you create a simulation and you go into it. And then you, and it's so good, you can't tell it from the real thing, kind of like The Matrix. And then you, when you're out of it, all of a sudden you realize it's like, wait a minute, what's the difference between the world I was in and this world? Meaning you realize how possible it is that this world could also be a simulation. And we only learned about this when we were developing games that there's, there's two things. One you may have heard of and one, one not, but I'll explain both of them real quick, which is the... Um, uh, the double slit experiment. Lots of people know about the, the old physics version. But the the layman's terms is if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, does it make a sound? And you get that thrown at you when you're in grade school. It's like, I don't know. You scratch your head and you have no freaking idea. But now we do know. And it's like, no, it doesn't make a sound because there is no tree. The tree hasn't been rendered yet. And what that means is in the, in the video game world, or any simulation world, we'll just call it video game, you see a mountain off in the distance. I don't care what game you're playing, whatever, GTA, Minecraft, Warcraft, doesn't matter. If you see a mountain off in the distance, is that player ever going to be on the other side of that mountain? For, no. Why not? Yeah. Well, because this path goes this way and he's never going to go that way. All right. Is there, do you draw the other side of the mountain? Do you render it? Are there trees on the other side? Is there bushes? Are there little squirrels? Right no, why not? Because the character's not going to go there. Because it's, it's a waste of resources. And you're going, okay, what's your point? The point is, is the new, the, the double slit experiment, especially the single electron gun experiment that was done in the early 2000s, where, by accident, when you're, basically they're firing, elect, you, you know this experiment, they're firing electrons downrange and they turn off the observation thing. They turn off the camera and the, the electrons aren't acting like electrons anymore. They're not acting like particles anymore. They're like, acting like waves. They're basically, they're undefined. They're fuzzy. And when you look at them, they're, they're particles again. It's like, well, okay, you t again, camera on, camera off, camera on, camera off. It keeps doing exactly what we are doing in our simulations now that we're making. It's, it's called flashlight graphics, meaning if you're in a game, you're looking forward, right? Whatever's behind you, we're not rendering. We're rendering so barely just to, just to, so it can load faster if you spin around real fast. But there's basically nothing behind you. But you don't know that because, you, again, you're in, you're in a simulation. 
So why are we seeing that here? Why is that happening now here in this world? Which is what, again, the premise of the 13th floor that was, okay, you drive out somewhere. It was way ahead of its time. You drive out somewhere where your character would never, ever go. Do the graphics stay rendered? Uh, well, in this world, of course they would because there, there's no such thing as a place you wouldn't go. It, it seems pretty wide open. But the other one that, that I love so much, and this one I, I almost guarantee you don't know about, is called the, um, you can look, there's a wiki entry on it called Neuroscience versus Free Will, which is just fascinating. Of course, science geeks love hooking electrodes up to people's heads. Why not? <laughs> Hook up electrodes to your head. Put you on a computer. Start hitting numbers, right? And it's like, all right, choose number between one and nine on the computer. And um, also note when you decided to pick the number, right? So if I say pick a number between one and 10, and you say four, right? You decide at that moment, four, right? Well, this is where it gets weird. The computer knows that you chose that number. Didn't know exactly what number you chose, but it knew you choose a, chose a number eight seconds ago. Before the question was even asked, it knew you were going to choose a number and you're going, well, that's impossible. That's predestination. Science hates that. That means that you're not even living in a free interactive reality. You could be, it's not even just a virtual movie. You could, I'm sorry, in virtual reality, you could be living in a virtual movie, which means, think about the resources it would say. And that, it makes total sense. If you think about it from a software standpoint, meaning if you want to save total resources, what you do is you, before a person goes into the virtual reality, you have them make all the big choices ahead of time. You know, what career they're going to do, who they're going to marry, how many kids, blah, 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 blah. Right. And then just before they go in, you block the memory before that point. So they never knew they chose those decisions. That's where it gets just wild. Because again, that's, that's kind of, kind of like, do you ever watch anybody on, I know I'm just kind of dragging this out a little bit. Do you ever watch any YouTube videos of kids playing video games? Ever watch any of those? Uh, yeah, no, yeah, I've seen video, uh, I've seen like a gamer. Yeah, play, play, playthroughs, you know, where they're just like, okay, I'm going to take you through blah, blah, blah. You know, the kids are so lazy nowadays, they don't even play their own games. They just watch other people play games. Well, you don't realize when you're watching that game, you're only watching a very, very small chunk of memory here. It's just a movie, right? But you're but you're watching the whole playthrough. You know, there's a huge interactive thing supposedly happening, but you're just watching a recording of it. Um, the only analogy I can give is like this. Um, imagine you're the director of a movie, right? And you have total control. I don't know if you've ever done any film stuff, but you, you're going to direct a movie. You pick the cast, you pick the music, you pick the cinematography, everything, right? You make all these decisions. And then you finish the movie, but just before the movie comes out, you get into a, a small car accident, and you bump your head, right? And you forget that you even made the freaking movie, right? But they feel sorry for you. They put a bandage on your head. It's like, oh, you should come to the premiere anyway. You, your memory will come back to you eventually. You go to the premiere. Everybody else sitting next to you is just watching a movie. Right, But for you, it's the greatest movie ever because all the choices that are made on the screen, subconsciously, you made them ahead of time, but you just forgot that you made them. So, the, again, it's fascinating thing. So, sorry, long story short. Yeah. We, we, do I think we're living in a virtual area? Yeah, yeah, absolutely I do. Um, but I, but the, the, pe the general public has such a hard time absorbing it that I have to start with things that are even more simple. I mean, I'm saying, okay, we're living basically in a sound stage, which is kind of like a virtual reality, and it's enclosed. But then that's even tougher for some people, so I have to start with even something more basic, which is, look, it's flat. Because, by the way, every simulation, every game that you've ever played, I know there's some weird ones out there, but 99% of the games you've played are all completely flat. They're absolutely boxed in. Yeah, I know there's valleys and hills and mountains. I'm saying that the, the edges line up. And in fact, the, the sky isn't even a dome. It's, it's called the skybox system where all the graphics are made and everything. You're living in, in, in every simulation that we make. It's just this big box because the computer's... So is that in the sky, isn't it? is that in contrast to the, to the flat earth theory view? Well, in the, flat, in, the flat earth theory view, in the flat earth theory, we think it's a dome. Right. However, 
even that dome eventually, let's say you're living in a snow globe, eventually that snow globe is going to have to have squared off ed- edges because that's how engineering works. Engineering is all about edges and right angles and stuff. I mean, computers literally don't, do not know how to draw a circle. We, we can get them close, but it's really just tiny, tiny, tiny little right angles. We, we don't even know how to explain a circle to, to a computer. We can simulate it, but that's about as close as we can get. So do, are we living in a dome? Yeah, probably. But is that dome squared off at some point? Yeah, maybe. I would if I was designing it. But if they, as long as they don't know, who cares? Sort of like, by the way, you didn't ask the question, but which is why don't game developers put in a curve into the, the big realms like GTA or Warcraft, you know, massive, massive realms? Because the, the player's never going to notice. Player's never going to notice that there's no curve. They're just going to go off and off and off into the distance. There's no atmosphere either. But they're not going to know that because you, you can build in layers of, of visibility. You can, you can crank up the visibility distance, which is weird because when you're in a simulation and you're really in, in a vacuum, even though you can simulate wind and dust and all that, there's nothing there. It's fascinating. See what you're saying. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I appreciate you kind of explaining and giving a – I was curious about what your thoughts are, were on that. Yeah. Um, so I appreciate you explaining it that way. But um, – yeah, I think I'm about ready to wrap it up on my end. And again, I appreciate you so much, like taking the time to talk to me, explain uh, Flat Earth, uh, some of the, the, especially the gaming stuff. I yeah. was really excited to talk to you about that. Um, so where can where can uh, listeners find your content online? Uh, the best way to find my content is to just type in either my name, Mark Sargent, into YouTube. Uh, I don't go on all the different social media platforms. I, I've never done Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram or any of that stuff. I hate myself on camera. Oh, God, I hate it. I'm one of those people that does not take good pictures. The um, uh, Or you could type in Flat Earth Mark into Google or, again, YouTube, and you'll find my channel. But don't just – if you're going to look at this – and I don't recommend anyone looking at Flat Earth because it's a rabbit hole that, again, it's like the Matrix. Once you go down to a certain point, you will not be able to come back. And that's not reverse psychology. I'm honestly being saying, it's like, look, if you're happy the way things are, don't do it. Because everybody that goes down, it goes a little crazy. Um, but look at other, other people's content. There's, in fact, there's a wonderful playlist on my channel. I've got a thousand videos, so I have to divide it up into playlists. There's one called the Flat Earth Shortlist for New People. Wonderful content by a great assortment from people uh, running anywhere from five minutes long to a couple hours long. And it's, uh, again, don't, well, all the stuff I've been rattling off to you to tonight, uh, don't take my word for it. Do your own research. Ask questions and figure it out for yourself. All right. Well, thank you very much again, Mark. And maybe I'll talk to you later. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.